Okay, um, hello everybody. Uh, welcome again in our uh, weekly academic activity. Uh, today we're going to have um, two sessions, the one anomaly of the coronary artery by Dr. Sara, and the other one is COVID-19 and cardiovascular disease by Dr. Muslim Salam. And uh, guest, our guest consultant is Dr. Ala Azhari, a cardiac surgery consultant from uh, KMC. Um, Dr. Sara, if you are ready, you can start. Uh, yes, I'm ready. Uh, is my voice clear? Yes. Okay, you can start. Thank you. Okay. Assalamu uh, alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Labon. Uh, I'm Sarah Labon, cardiac surgery resident. Uh, 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 I was to talk, inshallah, I will talk about the coronary artery anomalies. It's going to be supervised by uh, Dr. Ala Azhari, our cardiac surgery consultant, Kina uh, Abdullah Medical City, Mecca. Okay. So uh, now we will start with, uh, sorry, we will start with the table of content. We will talk simply about the uh, embryology, uh, normal variations, definition of the coronary artery anomalies, imaging modalities, uh, prevalence, uh, anomaly scores, classification, literature review will be go through uh, each of the classification. Uh, we will finish with a case report and conclude to the key points. Okay, starting with the imperiology, uh, coronary results develop through uh, an angiographic uh, angiogenic program that is start when the heart size increase and the coronary blood vessels start to emerge on the ventricle as an immature vascular plexus that is high, highly branched network of a small, similar sized vessels. This plexus will undergo a branching morphogenesis and a massive expansion to cover and infiltrate the entire myocardium attached to the aorta to initiate a blood flow and triggering arterial remodeling that it lead to immature arteries. Uh, let's talk about some of the normal variations that can be seen in, uh, 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 and diagnosed in, uh, as, as an incidental finding uh, in normal patients. Uh, coronary dominance uh, uh, will be classified uh, or identified with the origin of the posterior descending artery is either coming from the right coronary artery in 70% of patients or from the circumflex artery in 10% of patients and a core dominance in 20%. Uh, another normal variation will be a trifurcation of the lit, uh, left main artery with uh, ramus intermedius in 20% of patients. Uh, conus branch can uh, directly emerge from the right sinus of Valsalva in 10 to 15% of patients, as uh, we can see, uh, as we can appreciate uh, here in uh, picture A, coming uh, separately uh, with a separate origin in the right, from the right coronary sinus, from the right sinus of Valsalva, sorry. Uh, another normal variation is the origin of the with an acute take of angle from the aortic wall in uh, less than or equal to 45 degree, seen in 2% of patient, uh, or a high take of angle uh, or high take of sorry with the coronary RCM coming out uh, with more than uh, one centimeter above the central tubular junction, that is uh, more often seen in the right coronary artery, as we can see here in the figure B, coming out above the central tubular junction. Also, multiple ostium, uh, where there is an absence of the left main uh, and the LAD and the circumflex will be arising from two separate ostia that is coming out from the left sinus of Valsalva that is seen in 0.4% of patients. In, uh, you can see here in a CT of a uh, patient that have an offset left main and uh, LAD and circumflex coming out the separate ostium. Single ostium uh, is a very rare congenital anomaly. Uh, uh, it's uh, seen with the, uh, happening with the isolated coronary artery that it arises from a single coronary ostium, uh, which will provide a uh, coronary blood supply to the entire myocardium. As you can see here, a single coronary artery coming out, giving uh, LAD in the blue line, uh, giving the uh, RCA and the left circumflex. So by definition, coronary artery anomalies include a severe congenital condition that is characterized by an abnormal origin, course, or termination of any of the three main epicardial coronary arteries. Uh, the common complication of uh, coronary, uh, that is seen in coronary artery anomalies will be uh, one of the sudden cardiac, uh, uh, sudden cardiac death. That is uh, one of the first presentation in patients with coronary anomalies. 
uh, MI, that is uh, one of the episodic feature uh, with the interarterial course that we'll talk about inshallah later on with the presentation. Endocarditis is especially important in patients with uh, coronary artery fistula that will drain to a chamber, an infected chamber at the point of the fistula entrance. Heart failure will be seen, uh, especially in patients uh, with uh, coronary anomalies originated from the pulmonary artery, where there is a left to right shunt will end up in causing the patient with a heart failure. Uh, case of atherosclerosis, uh, again, in patients with fistula due to high pressure system, this uh, disturbance of the flow can, co can cause or activate uh, uh, the process of atherosclerosis. Our imaging modalities here, uh, it's either by uh, invasive or non-invasive. Uh, the invasive modality or the conventional or the uh, conventional coronary angio, uh, it used to be the, uh, uh, the most common used uh, uh, modalities in classifying and identifying coronary artery anomalies. However, because of its invasiveness and the lack of uh, three-dimensional images, it has been progressively replaced by the coronary CT. So now the coronary CT angio one of the basic modalities that is now the gold standard technique in uh, coronary artery anomalies. It offers us uh, a good characterization of the anatomical clues. Uh, it allows us a, a good visual, uh, visualization of the surrounding cardiac and then cardiac structure with the three-dimensional uh, 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 three dimensional relations. Uh, cardiac MRI now it's emerged as a new role uh, with the coronary CT, uh, with the, uh, coronary CT angio. Uh, it can offer us a ass good assessment of the presence and extension of uh, 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 of the late renal enhancement, which will help us in uh, associating the coronary anomalies with the myocardial ischemia. Uh, finally, echo uh, with the trans uh, trans trans thoracic approach is a good key examination in the diagnostic workup in the coronary artery anomalies, where the transesophageal approach will give us a good identification of uh, both the origin and the initial tract of the coronary arteries with a uh, good assessment of the chamber volume, good tractility, and the valve status. Okay, so um, Let's talk about now the prevalence. So coronary artery anomalies were first described in the 18th century, but the first scientific statement uh, it was for, uh, and their prevalence and comprehensive classification was first published in the 1996. Uh, so uh, we can see here uh, a pre uh, prevalence was taken from an article from the American Association uh, in, uh, published in 2021 titled coronary artery anomalies. It shows us the, uh, the change on the prevalence uh, uh, while using the invasive technique ranging from 1 to 5.6%. With the non-invasive, by using a, a coronary CT angio, it yields a further epidemiological prevalence, prevalence uh, reaching up to 7.9%. So the anomalous course that we will, uh, will guide us in our presentation today uh, classified in two, uh, uh, two uh, classification, the malignant and benign course. The malignant course, as we can see in figure A, uh, uh, it's called an interarterial uh, inter, uh, inter course that can be associated with uh, intramural segments, uh, we will say later on in the presentation, as it's considered as a malignant course. Uh, the benign course will be uh, retroaortic, as you see in picture B, uh, prepulmonary in picture C, septal or subpulmonary, where the uh, where the anomalous segments will pass below the pulmonary artery, uh, as you can see in uh, figure D. Okay, so. To guide our classification and uh, in the presentation, uh, I have taken it uh, uh, um, a table that from the uh, same uh, article from the Operating Heart Association, uh, very nicely classifying the coronary artery anomalies into uh, the, ana uh, the anatomical origin, the course, or the termination, which are their subtypes. So we will go through each one, inshallah, starting with the origin of the pulmonary artery. So uh, coronary artery originated from the pulmonary artery is a rare condition that is associated with a high mortality and infancy uh, with 90% of the patients uh, dying within the first year of life. The most common is the, uh, the coronary, uh, <clears throat> sorry, 
the most uh, common uh, anomalies will be the, uh, uh, the alpaca, which is uh, the anomalies of the left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery with 0.24% and up to 0.46%. Uh, rarely it will manifest in adult uh, life as majority will present with uh, setting cardiac death. Uh, and it has an occasional uh, uh, association uh, with other congenital anomalies like uh, beta text arteriosis, ventricular receptor defect, heterology of palate, and cortication of the aorta. So the clinical presentation classify into infant and adult type uh, on the basis of the hemodynamic changes on the extent of the intracoronary collateral development and the coronary steel with left to right shunt that result in heart failure. So um, uh, uh, what happened is uh, at birth, uh, the infected uh, newborns will be asymptomatic as the pulmonary artery resistance is high, allowing an integrate flow in the anomalous coronary artery. Uh, which giving a sufficient or adequate uh, myocardial perfusion. But uh, uh, and in case of uh, good uh, intracoronary collateral, as we can see here coming out from the right system, in case of sufficient collateral, uh, the infant phase can, can be tolerated and survive into the adulthood with the minor symptoms. But as the patient uh, grow uh, and the pulmonary resistance pres uh, pressure will be decreased, the uh, left coronary artery uh, and the collateral flow will tend to pass into the low pressure toward the pulmonary artery, and the coronary artery still develop from the myocardium, resulting in uh, myocardial ischemia and infraction. So before going to the surgical uh, management of the anomalous surgery from the pulmonary artery, uh, I would like to show you the guideline that was published in 2018 in the American Heart Association regarding the management at, uh, of adults with a congenital heart disease in, uh, in the topic of the anomalies of coronary artery arising from the pulmonary artery. So surgery is recommended for anomalous left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery as a class one indication. In an asymptomatic adult with anomalous right coronary artery from the pulmonary artery with, with symptoms attributed to the anomalous coronary, surgery is also recommended as a class 1. In, uh, surgery for anomalous right coronary artery from the pulmonary artery is reasonable in asymptomatic adult with a ventricular dysfunction or with myocardial ischemia attributed to anomalous right coronary artery from the pulmonary artery as a class 2A. Okay. Let's move on now to the surgical options. So uh, we have three surgical techniques that can be used in managing patients with uh, uh, anomalies originated from the pulmonary artery. The first one we'll talk about is the coronary button uh, um, trans uh, the coronary button transfer. So uh, uh, in this technique, uh, the pulmonary will be transected, and uh, the anomalous artery is removed with the button of tissue then it's going to be uh, mobilized to the aortic root uh, uh, and, uh, and the and uh, the autologous, uh, the, uh, the thing will be anastomosed in the correct uh, aortic root. Uh, in this technique, uh, in the adults, is often not favorable due to a long distance between the aorta and the ostium of the left coronary artery. Also, um, with time, with the, uh, with the late presentation of the uh, of this anomaly, uh, the left coronary artery can be can be discovered to be dilated, thin walled, friable over time, which increases of risk of uh, tearing, bleeding, and manipulation and kinking uh, in this procedure. Another procedure is the Takuchi repair. Uh, in this one, uh, as you can see here in uh, uh, in A, it involved the creation of aorto pulmonary window. The pulmonary artery is opened, and the anterior flap of tissue is formed uh, uh, and is used here uh, uh, to create an intra pulmonary tunnel. So the buffer of the aorta to the anomalous coronary ostium. This technique has fallen uh, out of favor uh, due to its late complication, uh, such as probable pulmonic stenosis, and it's required the familiarity with. Uh, this technique. The last one is cabbage. So in this technique, uh, uh, we will start with uh, ligating the proximal uh, coronary anomalies that form the pulmonary artery uh, to prevent the competitive flow and finishing off with the uh, grafts. As we can appreciate here that uh, uh, after a successful cabbage and ligation, uh, um, uh, the regression of, and hypoplasia of the collateral will be over time.
Okay. Now let's move on to the another anomalies that is the uh, uh, anomalies originated from the aortic. So the anomalous origin of the coronary artery from the opposite sinus uh, with an interarterial coast is known to be detected at a rate of 0.15 in up to 0.39. Left coronary artery can be arising from the right sinus, as we can see here in figure A, coming out with the intramural course, uh, and picture B coming out with the intraarterial course. Uh, but the RCA is uh, arising from the left sinus of the is actually the commonest. Um, this anomaly is mostly associated with the sudden cardiac death when the course is interarterial, as we as we say it in uh, picture B, particularly with an intramural segments. Uh, it's implicated during an intense exercise due to expanding of the great vessels and compressing of the anomalous artery. Okay. Um, before going through a guideline and surgical technique, I'll just try uh, want to uh, appreciate about the another common or it could be the most common congenital variant where the circumflex artery coming out from the right coronary artery, and it has uh, three subtypes. The type one when, where the uh, uh, separate ostia coming out from the RCA and the left circumflex artery. Type two, where it's have a common ostia in the right sinus, as we can appreciate here in uh, picture A, is arising from uh, a common ostia and the circumflex going through an intra-arterial course between the left atrium and the aorta. And the final type is the circumflex arising from the branch of the uh, proximal RCA. Again, for the same guideline 2018, um, so if the anomalous aortic origin of the coronary artery was a left coronary artery from the right uh, sinus and patients have uh, ischemic symptoms or ischemia during diagnostic testing, uh, then a surgical intervention will be a class one. If there is no ischemic symptoms, then a surgical intervention will be a class two A. In regard of the right coronary artery from the left sinus, again, if there's an ischemic uh, changes uh, or ischemic symptoms, uh, class one indication will be a surgery. If it's not, and the patient exhibiting a ventricular arrhythmia, then a surgical intervention will be class two A. If patient have not uh, ischemic symptoms, neither a ventricular arrhythmia, then either surgical intervention or continued observation will be a class 2B. Okay. So the surgical option managing patient, uh, uh, patient anomalies from the aortic origin, we have uh, three options, coronary unroofing, reimplantation, and cabbage. We will uh, start talking about the coronary unroofing. Um, so here, the common wall uh, of the intramural uh, proximal to the aorta will be unroofed uh, through its uh, open up through its entire length. I have here a um, short video intro of showing the unroofing. Sorry. Okay. So uh, after standard cannulation following a median serotomy, uh, a transverse aortotomy will be made. And after a good anatomical identification, um, we'll start by, uh, 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 by uh, uh, inserting a probe or a clamp uh, through the intramural uh, coronary artery. Uh, with the overlying common wall will be uh, uh, dissected or uh, unroofed. For the reimplantation, um, as you can see in the image, uh, the intermural portion of the artery will be unroofed and the proximal left corner is immobilized. Uh, it will be reimplanted into the protected left uh, sinus uh, and the aortic wall defect. Uh, uh, after the excision will uh, uh, will be patched with uh, bovine pericardium. Um, uh, in this technique with the reimplantation, uh, it's quite challenging that uh, uh, going through an appropriate uh, angle uh, with the reimplantation uh, to the corrected uh, sinus. Finally, we have the cabbage. So um, as you can see here in the picture, uh, it's actually... Um, uh, an anomalous right coronary artery uh, originated uh, from uh, the left sinus. Uh, it was uh, managed uh, uh, surgically with cabbage by grafting uh, the right internal mammary artery. So um, 
Generally, cabbage has a limited value in young patients, particularly with the pain grafts, as a normal, very, uh, normal uh, native coronaries uh, will be uh, showing a high risk of uh, competitive flow on graft failure. So it's reserved for those with a concomitant atherosclerosis disease or those with uh, unfavorable anatomy for androphing. Although um, in this uh, table, uh, it was taken from the American Heart Association article uh, published in 2021, titled Surgical Technique for the Treatment of Anomalous Origin of the Right Coronary Artery from the Left Sinus. Um, in this table, um, uh, the three surgical options, the unroofing, cabbage, and the reimplantation, was uh, uh, in comparison between uh, and the advantage and disadvantage of each one. So um, I just want you to appreciate here that in the cabbage, uh, it's most commonly performed in a cardiac operation as the all cardiac surgeon are quite familiar with this technique. Uh, it has a huge advantage of avoidance of the overtosomy and it will not require the manipulation of uh, intercoronary commissure and it can give the option uh, to be achieved with either uh, on or off pump uh, cabbage. Okay. Let's move on to anomalies of the course, starting with myocardial bridging. So a myocardial bridging is a congenital anomaly in which the coronary artery tunnel through the myocardium. It's prone to increase myocardial compression, mechanical load, endothelial damage, and a vascular remodeling. So during systole, it undergoes a narrowing lead to a disruption of blood flow, a set to the exertional angina, acute coronary syndrome, arrhythmias, syncope, or sudden cardiac death. It can be found in any epicardial artery, but most commonly seen in left anterior descending artery in 67 to 98% of patients. Uh, I have here a very nice video uh, of, um, sorry, one second. So three important signs can be can uh, get us in the diagnosis of myocardial bridging, uh, bridging in coronary angio. Uh, the, the bridged segment will be straight as the tertiary as usually sign of uh, uh, the uh, artery running out in the epicardium. Uh, these segments will be free of cipular branches and it show a very distinguished milking effect. And I want to appreciate here that uh, um, in this my, uh, myocardial bridging, the septal branches that are coming out distal to the bridged segment uh, is affected with the hyperperfusion during the systole. Okay. A small talk about the pathophysiology uh, regarding a myocardial bridging. So the intramural and distal segment of the bridged vessels remain free from the atherosclerotic disease, while the proximal segment of the vessels is prone to develop atherosclerosis. The segment immediately proximal to the bridge where the uh, wall shear stress is low, it demonstrates a structurally dysfunctional endothelial cell with a great black progression. As you can appreciate here in the late, uh, in the late stage, uh, uh, the muscle will be hypertrophied with over time and uh, black progression uh, will be uh, uh, increased uh, higher risk to, in the proximal uh, segments. Uh, also, with the negative remodeling of the vessel, uh, it, with time, it will uh, cause a decrease in the lumen diameter. Okay, so um, regarding a vasodilate, vasodilation, uh, vasodilator in bridging, pure vasodilating agent as uh, nitroglycerin should be used with cautious. Although nitrate have an antispasmodic uh, properties and can decrease the preload, and they can uh, uh, they can worsen the symptoms by intensifying systolic compression of the bridged segments. So simply talking, it will dilate all the corners except the abnormal segments, as in here at the proximal bridged segments, and that will intensify the systolic compression. As you can see, uh, the picture B, uh, 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 it was. Uh, a bridge segments uh, after uh, the after giving of uh, nitroglycerin, as you can see, the systolic compression uh, is uh, intensifying here. Managing patient with bridging, in case of incidental finding, nothing will be done. Uh, uh, close observation will be just enough. But if patient presents with ischemia on stress test, 
uh, medical therapy will be the first uh, the first to be started with a beta blocker and the calcium blocker. But in case of uh, uh, altered uh, hemodynamics, uh, revascularization will be considered. Okay, so that uh, our surgical uh, options would be either by supraarterial myotomy or capish. So in case of myotomy, uh, complication will be wall perforation, ventricular aneurysm, and postoperative bleeding. So uh, let's see three, uh, in picture A. Uh, so after standard cannulation followed by metastenotomy, that can be achieved with either on and off pump. Um, uh, then, uh, sorry, okay. Then uh, 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 epicardial uh, retractor will be inserted to expose the bridge segments, and uh, the bridge segment above will, uh, the muscle above will be the, will be dissected in myotomy or resected in myomectomy by using a plate or a very low voltage uh, cutter. Other options will be cabbage. It will be fibered uh, over uh, myomotomy in case of uh, an extensive bridging more than 25 millimeter or in deep segments more than five millimeter or where their bridge segment fail to decompress completely in diastole where myotomy will be unlikely to, to correct the persistent diastole decompression. Let's move to another anomaly that's coming out from uh, from the uh, origin of, uh, from the course, so aneurysm. It's defined as uh, more than 1.5 uh, uh, increase in the normal diameter of the normal coronary arteries. Uh, destruction of the basal media resulted in increased wall stress and subsequent dilatation, causing a mechanical compression distal to the obstruction. 50% uh, is caused by atherosclerosis in adult, uh, and uh, other causes will be include a congenital. Uh, inflammatory process like in Kawasaki disease uh, or connective tissue disease. Where the RCA is the most affected vessels in 40.4%, LAD will be seen with 32.3%, circumflex will be presented in 23.4%, and rarely you can see an aneurysmal lift main artery with a very uh, low percentage with 3.5%. You can see here. Um, a coronary angio showing uh, uh, aneurysmal right coronary artery. Okay. So managing patient with uh, coronary artery aneurysm would be either with a percutaneous treatment or surgical intervention. So the precursor treatment by coil embolization. Uh, in this case, in case of uh, acute coronary syndrome, PCI of the aneurysmal culvert artery is set to the high risk of failure due to a thrombus burden. Uh, the interf uh, interventionist will be will place the, the stent. After that, will be followed by uh, coil embolization uh, uh, in the aneurysm. The surgical option will include aneurysmal ligation or resection, followed by uh, bypass grafting. Moving on to our final coronary anomalies today is the fistula. So fistula is an abnormal communication between coronary artery and other cardiovascular structure. It's seen in 0.2 up to 0.6% of uh, population. Uh, the majority are congenital, uh, but it can be atherogenic, like in stint, following the stent placement, pacemaker insertion, radio frequency, or even cabbage. RCA being the most common site of origin in coronary arteriovenous fistula. Um, in the image here, we can see uh, uh, a large coronary artery fistula coming out from the mid-segment of uh, LAD, uh, uh, where it's draining to the pulmonary artery. You can be here coming out from the mid-segments, where it's connected to the pulmonary artery. So the drainage site of coronary artery fistula will be classified in two categories. The first one will be the coronary cameral fistula, and the other one will be the atriovenous fistula. In the coronary cameral fistula, the drain will be in a cardiac chamber where 90% of the fistula will drain to a low pressure venous circulation and most commonly in the right ventricle. The most frequent uh, fistula in this type will be from the right coronary artery in 50%, uh, uh, but it can be urgent from the left coronary artery in 35% or bilaterally with 5%. In coronary uh, uh, arterial venous fistula, it will drain into any segment of the pulmonary or systemic circulation. So uh, regarding the steel phenomena, um, 
here uh, adult will be presented uh, in a percentage of 65 to 75% with symptoms like chest pain, short of breath, or arrhythmias. It will result from a coronary flow into a low chamber, a low pressure system with aneurysmal uh, as a response to the coronary, to the steel phenomena with the risk of thrombosis or rupture. Our treatment option here is the first uh, treatment option is the transcatheter by emplaster, vascular occluders, and coils being the most popular options. Uh, in case of failed the transcatheter uh, technique, cabbage will be used uh, in case of failed or due to a complicity or multiple fistula connection. You can see here uh, in picture D, uh, uh, there was a fistula. Uh, similar to the coronary angio that was seen before, uh, rising from the uh, from the mid-segments of the LED, uh, draining into the pulmonary artery. Uh, in this patient, it was managed uh, surgically by cabbage grafting uh, the lift and anterior mammary artery to the LED. Okay. Uh, now we have finished our classification and talking about the coronary anomalies. We have here a case, an interested case report. Um, we have a 53 years old male patient that uh, has no medical history. He presented to the ER with a three month uh, history, a uh, complaint of accidental chest pain. Patient was admitted and it was done for him. Uh, it shows a global mild improvement of the LP function with a suction fraction ranging from 40 to 50% with no regional wall motion abnormalities. Uh, for this patient, uh, CT angio and the uh, coronary angio was done, uh, uh, and it shows an anomalous origin of the LED. So uh, in picture A on the left on the CT, we can appreciate here that uh, uh, it will demonstrate the uh, uh, origin of the LED from the RCA with a tortuous proximal pit. Um, uh, 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 it, and see here we can see uh, appreciate the proximal LED uh, to have very tortuous length it's arising from the RCA then it goes to an anterior uh, pathway. Later on, angio was done for the patient. As you can see, uh, it shows uh, it confirmed the diagnosis of uh, apparent LED originated from the right corner artery, uh, then taken out the an anterior pathway. So as patient was presented with uh, hemodynamic changes and ischemic symptoms, um, a patient was uh, successfully managed uh, with the cabbage. Uh, single graft was uh, uh, managed with uh, single graft to Alima to LED. Uh, patient went uh, successfully and uh, follow up uh, echo uh, 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 and angio was uh, showing uh, a good in the patient. So before we finish our presentation, let's just review uh, or conclude with the key, small key points. So coronary artery anomalies will be associated one of the first presentation with a sudden cardiac death. In case of uh, coronary CT entry and cardiac MRI, <clears throat> are both an excellent non-invasive mortalities that is allow comprehensive anatomical evaluation. Uh, <clears throat> Anomalous origin of the coronary artery from the opposite uh, sinus with an intra-arterial course, specifically where there is an intramural segment. Coronary artery origin of the pulmonary artery and coronary artery fistula are the most three important uh, coronary artery anomalies that have an important clinical implication, and these usually offer required treatment or a surgical correction. Anatomical correction of the anomaly should only be made after uh, uh, incorporating all available information as age, symptoms, and imaging information, and it should be individually balanced against the risk of, <clears throat> of uh, an interventional uh, procedure. So that concludes my presentation regarding coronary artery anomalies. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Asara, for your presentation. Um, does anyone have any questions? Assalamu alaikum. Shukran lika Sarah for your presentation, but I have one comment. Uh, go back to the pulmonary origin. Sarah? 
Yes, teacher, I can hear it. Yeah. I can hear it just a second. Yeah, go back to the primary origin. Surgical options. And option three. Yes, option three cannot uh, cabbage. Yes, in technology, uh, ligation before the cabbage, like in the correct order, so the cabbage, then ligation or clip proximal to the anastomosis. Uh, in general, excellent, excellent talk, excellent presentation, and uh, preparation also. If, uh, if, uh, if there is any questions, please. Yeah, uh, Sara. I just want to ask, could you please uh, summarize the indications for surgical um, or the indications for surgery in this uh, on this slide? Because you mentioned the different options, but you don't tell us about. Um, oh, often it's not the pulmonary; it's actually for the aneurysm. aneurysm. So, what are the indications? Like how, like what are the cutoff? Um, for example, size or growth. If you could just summarize it, please. And thank you so much. In the aneurysm? Yes. Okay. Uh, we have a two uh, uh, surgical uh, or two options for uh, treatment patient with coronary artery aneurysm, either by percutaneous treatment or surgical intervention. Uh, um, um, so uh, mm -hmm. you can go for a cone implantation uh, uh, in case of small aneurysm, or can go for surgical intervention uh, uh, with the ligation of resection uh, when a percutaneous option will be uh, uh, unavailable. Uh, if there is any further indication, Dr. Allah, if you have any comments on this part. Uh, sure. The indication for coronary anomalies if uh, the coronary anomalies are mimicking the MI uh, symptoms. Symptomatic patient, uh, especially for aneurysm uh, coronary, we can have uh, abnormal blood flow, abnormal blood velocity, which provoke a uh, thrombosis. Uh, so thrombosis is uh, one of the biggest uh, indication uh, diagnosed by coronary angio. And uh, treatment option can be uh, either by uh, interventionist or cabbage surgeon. As a cabbage. Let's say the patient was found uh, to have this aneurysm incidentally. Would you still go for elective surgery or would you try um, the coil embolization uh, or whatever, like uh, whatever option by the interventional? Are you okay, going to look so at the size? I mean, yes. I don't know. So I'll go back to the indication, the end of 2018. Indication, if patient is symptomatic, we will go for surgery, class A, one. If no, we'll not uh, go for uh, There is no surgical indication. Symptomatic patient, yes. Unsymptomatic patient, no. Complication. Regardless like thrombus, of the yes. size. Okay. Uh, yeah. If it's right, suddenly, without any complication, MI or MI symptoms. All right, clear. Thank you. Although there is a no uh, uh, specific indication for or a guideline regarding aneurysm in uh, in American Association, but as general rule in coronary artery anomalies, in case of incidental finding, unfortunately, although a patient may present later on with a sudden cardiac death where there is late, uh, uh, it's too late to do anything. But till now, we have no clear guideline in uh, managing patients with uh, coronary artery anomalies in case of incidental finding with no ischemic symptoms or uh, ischemic sign with a stress test or diagnostic testing. Great, Sara. Thank you so much. Welcome. Yeah, I agree. It is very rare, but I think in some patients with genetic um, diseases who are already following up um they would have it, it is uh, uh something that could happen that they would find it incidentally um yeah that's why i asked but thank you you're more than welcome is there any other question
Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, we're gonna take a five minutes break and I'm gonna start the other session. Thank you.
السلام عليكم دكتور مسلم الله يعطيك العافيه دكتور عبد الرحمن ان شاء الله اشتغل يا اي ثينك وي وي كان بروسيد وذ اور سو يو كان بريزنت ذا كوفيد 19 كارد فاسكولار ديزيز يو كان ستارت يا Uh, today, inshallah, I will present to you the COVID-19 and uh, cardiovascular uh, disease. I'm uh, Muslim al Musawi from uh, Saud al Paptain Cardiac Center, uh, Dhamma. Uh, th- this presentation will be divided into two parts. First part, we'll talk about the epidemiology, pathophysiology, and, and the diagnosis, uh, some biomarkers, clinical presentation uh, of COVID-19 and mechanism uh, of COVID-19. So to, to start with uh, the introduction, this, uh, the severe uh, acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, Uh, which started in the 2019 in December in uh, Wuhan city in China that reached the pandemic level in March uh, uh, 2020 and caused a uh, repeated uh, wave of, of outbreaks uh, across the globe. Uh, <clears throat> uh, coronavirus has uh, many systemic uh, manifestations uh, and uh, has major implications Uh, for the cardiovascular system, especially. So epidemiology, the cardiovascular comorbidities are common in patients with uh, COVID-19. Uh, the presence of, uh, uh, of cardiovascular disease is associated with severe uh, COVID-19 and higher mortality. Uh, cardiovascular risk factors uh, are linked with uh, severe uh, COVID-19 and higher mortality also. Uh, cardiovascular manifestations and clinical course of COVID-19. COVID-19 has comparable cardiac manifestations to previous outbreaks of other coronaviruses, such as the Middle East coronavirus, uh, which is SARS-1. Uh, cardiac uh, manifestations are associated with the uh, worse uh, outcomes of COVID-19. Long-term manifestations are unclear Uh, so extensive follow-up is needed for patients with the COVID-19 post-infection. Concomitant conditions that may be associated with a, a more severe course of SARS-CoV-19, as you can see, uh, the chronic pulmonary disease, history of uh, heart failure, a waiting list uh, for cardiac surgery of course because patients waiting for cardiac surgery they have they, they are mostly hypertensive and diabetes and then some of them may be overweight and they might have the, they are coronary artery disease so cerebral vascular uh, disease sometimes and they are immune, immune deficiency some patients with immune deficiency or prior organ transplantation they are the most uh, severe uh, severely uh, impacted by covid-19 uh, pathophysiology and the mechanism of disease in relation to the uh, cardiovascular system so the pathophysi- the patho- pathophysiology or bi- biology of coronavirus infection involves Uh, the binding to the host angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor to mediate entry into into the cell, uh, and uh, the, those cells are uh, those uh, receptors expressed in the lung, heart, and uh, and vessels, and that, that's why those are the most uh, uh, affected uh, uh, cells in the body. Uh, cardiovascular disease associated with COVID likely involves dysregulation of the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme uh, system due to the SARS-CoV-2 infection and due to comorbidities uh, such as hypertension and also diabetes uh, may play a role also here. Uh, coronavirus directly infects human cardiomyocytes. This is another methogenesis uh, like uh, native and induced pluripotent uh, stem cell derived in an uh, uh, <clears throat> ACE, uh, ACE inhibitor, uh, receptor 2, and uh, these effects uh, can be inhibited by the antiviral uh, uh, drug 
remdesivir. Uh, cardiovascular disease comorbidity in uh, COVID-19 may be either primarily or secondary due to acute lung injury, which lead to the increased cardiac uh, workload. Uh, and uh, this is relevant to uh, in heart failure patients. Other molecules such as uh, neurolipin, neuro, neuropilin, uh, to uh, neuropelin one can facilitate uh, uh, the uh, COVID-19 uh, virus uh, entry into the cell and infectivity, also significant of the presence uh, of this process for the uh, cardiovascular diseases, unclear, but any entry to the cell that need uh, uh, the attachment of the uh, spike protein and uh, other uh, another uh, uh, regulatory markers to to uh, facilitate into cytosis by the cell i will show you in the next slide uh, the the uh, the mechanism that the patient enter to the to the cell uh, cytokine st cytokine uh, storm originating from the uh, imbalance of T cell activation and this regulate, regulated release of interleukin, especially interleukin 6 and interleukin uh, 17 and other cytokines may contribute to the cardiovascular disease in COVID-19 patients. Uh, the uh, interleukin-6 is, uh, is being tested uh, therapeutically. Uh, immune system activation along with the uh, immune metabolism at, uh, alternations may result in plaque instability in the coronaries, for example, and contribute to any acute coronary events. As you can see here, the effect of uh, coronavirus uh, in the uh, in, in the lung and uh, myocardial uh, damage. Uh, there are uh, lots of uh, uh, theories and pathogenesis starting from microvascular to the, uh, uh, the inflammatory storm uh, and uh, the uh, black rupture uh, to cause the myocardial infarctions, also arrhythmia and heart failure. Uh, due to the COVID-19. Uh, here, uh, the other uh, figure shows the, the how the coronavirus enters the cell. It needs, uh, it binds uh, to the, it binds to the, this one protein, bind to the receptor uh, on the membrane of the cell, and it needs to bind to other molecule also to to allow for endocytosis for entry in, in the cells. And then when the virus enters the cell, uh, undergoes RNA, uh, <clears throat> he, uh, it releases uh, the RNA and starts the uh, translation transcription using the machinery of the cell. And then uh, another exocytosis and the replication of the virus. So the virus using the host cell to replicate itself, which weakens the, the host cell. And uh, after uh, after a while, it causes the, uh, the uh, uh, damage to the cells. <clears throat> Strategies for diagnosing the uh, COVID. Uh, diagnosis of COVID-19 relies on a combination of uh, epidemiological criteria, contact, within the incubation period, uh, presence of clinical, clinical sim, uh, symptoms as well as laboratory testing, such as the, uh, the PCR and the clinical imaging-based uh, tests, uh, nucleic acid amplification tests are key diagnostic tests, uh, quality, quality of sample uh, collection, deep nasal swab, and the transport time to laboratories are essential to avoid false negative outcome, outcomes. A wide separate testing uh, proved uh, efficient in the contaminate, contaminant phase of the epidemi uh, epidemic. Um, <clears throat> uh, testing should be uh, as soon as possible to all symptomatic individuals. And uh, rapid antigen testing uh, can uh, contribute to overall testing capacity of the COVID-19, but the sensitivity is, is, is generally low. ELISA uh, can be used uh, to, to, uh, to detect uh, the presence of COVID-19. Uh, COVID Lung computer, uh, uh, the uh, CT, blank CT, uh, <clears throat> 
imaging may be used uh, as a diagnostic test for COVID also. Uh, diagnosis of cardiovascular conditions in the COVID-19 patients, clinical presentation first, chest pain, but also uh, dyspnea, cough, and respiratory distress. But those all shared between COVID-19 and uh, and the, the 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 cardiac diseases such as heart failure, patients will come with dyspnea and uh, shortness of breath, um, respiratory distress, maybe uh, chest pain in patients uh, with coronary syndromes, and also with COVID, he will have uh, some patients might have chest pain. So it's unclear uh, to distinguish. So putting uh, in COVID patient, we should uh, always take a look at the uh, cardiac site uh, and examine patient thoroughly. <clears throat> patients with uh, uh, with sus uh, suspected uh, or at risk of uh, cardiogenic shock and possible COVID-19 infections. Uh, consider the following conditions, acute decompensated heart failure, uh, large acute myocardial infarction, or relative uh, hypertension or tachycardia, always using the personal protective equipment and if possible, the dedicated uh, diagnostic equipment uh, if the shock is confirmed, yes, uh, then treat as inf uh, treat as infected. A proper monitoring for differential diagnosis with sepsis. If uh, <clears throat> uh, if no, not confirmed. So we confirm COVID and uh, uh, and uh, the uh, we start to uh, to treat uh, accordingly. Out of hospital cardiac arrest and pulseless electrical activity, sudden cardiac death, tachyarrhythmia, pradyarrhythmias uh, are seen in patients with COVID-19. Uh, <clears throat> uh, growing evidence worldwide shows a major decrease in the diagnosis and uh, management of cardiac arrhythmia during, uh, uh, during the current uh, the, the bandema. Uh, symptoms of bradyarrhythmia and tachycardia do not differ from the usual clinical presentation and also the management uh, to, however, given the overlap of some, some of the COVID clinical manifestations, both the general public and healthcare professional uh, should remain alert for the sign and symptoms of, of cardiac arrhythmia. Uh, there has been an increase in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in correlation with COVID-19 pandemic and a worsening in the short-term uh, outcome in hospital cardiac arrest. A patient is mainly secondary to Wilson's electrical activity or acetone, the shockable rhythms, uh, uh, VTAC, VF, uh, uh, are only present in a minority of cases. The uh, occurrence of arrhythmia in stable COVID-19 patients appears to be low. Uh, <clears throat> the biomarkers, biomarkers used uh, cardiomyocytes injury as quantified by the troponin, raised in troponin and hemodynamic stress by the PNP uh, <clears throat> concentrations. Uh, but both may increase in COVID uh, patients. So uh, the cardiac troponin and PNB concentration should be interpreted as quantitative uh, variables, and they are correlating with, uh, with disease severity and mortality. In patients hospitalized with COVID-19, mild elevations in cardiac troponin um, or PNB are in general the results of pre-existing cardiac disease or acute injury stress related to, to COVID in the absence of typical angina. So we correlate the laboratory findings to the clinical uh, clinical uh, symptoms of the patients. There is no, if there is no uh, typical angina or ischemic change in ACG patients with mild elevations to, to uh, less than two to three times the upper limit of normal do not require workup or treatment for type one uh, myocardial uh, uh, myocardial infarction. In patients with COVID-19, as in patients with other pneumonias, it is uh, suggested to measure cardiac troponin 
if the diagnosis of uh, a type 1 myofarsal infarction is being considered on a clinical ground, so there's a chest pain or a change in or a new onset of LV dysfunction in the patients. Uh, <clears throat> D-dimer um, uh, quant uh, quantifies activated coagulation, uh, prominent features, the uh, coagulopathy in, in COVID-19. In COVID this is a graph showing that the increased uh, concentration of high uh, sensitivity, sensitivity uh, troponin uh, means uh, a severe COVID and also means uh, if, if it's higher enough, uh, like uh, uh, two times or three, more than two times or three times the, the upper uh, limit of normal, uh, this may indicate um, I or myocarditis, uh, takotsub or shock in the patients. The lower, uh, it means uh, either chronic cardiac disease or mild COVID can cause increase in the in the in the uh, uh, troponin or BNB. Uh, what are the mechanisms that uh, that are involving? And uh, uh, that are involved in the elevation of the biomarkers. The, this is uh, um, um, showing that the, the, there is there are ischemic causes and non-ischemic causes. Type one myocardial infarction, which is the spontaneous type, and uh, type two myocardial infarction, which is the uh, increasing demand uh, due to hypoxia and uh, septic of oxygen due to hypoxia and uh, septic, uh, septic shock, tachycardia. This is ischemic cause, non-ischemic cause, a direct effect on myocardial cells, as we said, that the myocardium that has the ACE, in, uh, ACE uh, receptors, um, cytokine, uh, cytokine storm, also hypoxia-induced uh, apoptosis, myocarditis, pulmonary embolism, and Takotsubo uh, syndrome, or, and increase in chronic cardiac troponin uh, due to the uh, presence of, uh, of a cardiac disease, either known or unknown cardiac disease. Non-invasive for diagnosis, non-invasive imaging do not perform. These are the recommendations of the uh, European uh, Society, European Society of Cardiology do not uh, do not perform routine cardiac imaging in patients with, with suspected or confirmed COVID-19. Uh, perform imaging studies in patients with suspected or confirmed COVID only if the management is likely to be impacted, impacted by the by the results. Re-evaluation, which imaging technique is best for your patients, both in terms of a diagnostic yield and infectious risk uh, for the environment. Uh, Absolutely, it's a prime that the uh, healthcare providers should be protected. Uh, that's the main issue uh, in, in COVID-19 uh, era. The uh, imaging protocols should be kept as short as possible. Uh, TEE and uh, uh, transesophageal, transesophageal and transthoracic echo, avoiding performing transthoracic, transesophageal, and stress echocardiogram in patients uh, in which test uh, uh, results are li unlikely to change the management strategy. Uh, Transesophageal echo carries an increased risk of separate of uh, infection uh, and then and then uh, to the infection to the healthcare uh, provider. Uh, <clears throat> In COVID-19 infected patients, the, the echocardiogram should be performed focused solely on the uh, acquisition of the image needed to answer the clinical question uh, to, to reduce patient contact with the machine and also healthcare providers. Uh, point of care focus ultrasound or what's called the uh, POCUS or FOCUS. Uh, performed at bedside are effective uh, options to screen uh, for cardiovascular complications in, in COVID-19. Uh, computer tomography, uh, cardiovascular CT should be performed in hospitalized patients only with indications in which the imaging uh, will change the management. Uh, coronary 
coronary computer tomography and geography, coronary angio, CT angio, coronary, maybe they preferred non-invasive uh, imaging modality to diagnose coronary artery disease uh, since it reduces the time of exposure of patients and uh, the healthcare provi providers. Uh, cardiac CT may be preferred to, uh, to transesophageal echo uh, to roll out uh, alert atrial appendage and intracardiac thrombus prior to cardioversion uh, in patients with uh, uh, respiratory distress, uh, chest CT is recommended to evaluate uh, imaging features typical to, to COVID-19, uh, check the renal function always uh, when contrast is indicated for the patient. Exercise testing during physical exercise, the risk of virus separate is increased due to greater amount of aerosol and droplet uh, production. Uh, exercise testing should be avoided in COVID-19 suspected on positive cases. This is second part, um, second part of the presentation. We'll talk about the care pathways, treatment, follow-up, uh, some aspects uh, related to the uh, drugs used in COVID-19 uh, and uh, their effect on the cardiovascular uh, cardiovascular system. <clears throat> um, in, cardio, in cardiogenic shock, the, um, the management is a critically time-dependent requiring a dedicated network and multidisciplinary uh, expertise. Resource alloca allocation uh, should still try to deliver a standardized team-based approach, including availability and feasibility of mechanical supporting device. In phase of coronary angiography remains the mainstay of treatment in, in those patients. In patients with a concomitant COVID escalation to mechanical supporting, uh, mechanical circulatory support should be carefully weighted against the development of coagulopathy uh, uh, associated with COVID and the need uh, for specific treatment, for example, proposition uh, required for the acute lung, lung injury. In case of requirement, uh, ECMO uh, should be the preferred temporary uh, mechanical uh, circulatory support device because it uh, because of the oxygenation capacity. Uh, in case of acute renal failure, uh, continuous uh, renal replacement uh, therapy uh, should be used. Uh, daily evaluation of organs using the uh, SOFA, uh, SOFA criteria and therapeutic uh, intervention scoring system should be uh, assist for most critical patients to improve uh, decision decision making. <clears throat> uh, the safety the safety of healthcare provider is a is an important you know, uh, to avoid any infection, uh, and this is actually the prime uh, of the whole guidelines is the the protection providing standardized standardized. Uh, team-based approach and uh, protection to the healthcare also provider. <clears throat> um, a COVID infection should should be excluded through two negative tests performed using the uh, polymerized chain reaction, uh, but also uh, should uh, personnel in the hospital should be trained. Uh, to provide cardiopulmonary resuscitation with patients in uh, prone in prone position. <clears throat> this is a, a schema uh, for uh, the management of patients with uh, cardiogenic shock or out of hospital uh, cardiac arrest. Detection of COVID and respiratory uh, samples upon the admission, positive uh, positive COVID. Uh, so if we have uh, the COVID results, it's positive. Uh, dedicated uh, network, well equipped and trained staff, prioritize healthcare workers uh, protection, uh, very important. Be more restrictive with uh, mechanical uh, security uh, support if needed. Consider ECMO as we mentioned previously. If negative, treat as usual. 
dedicate network and send patients uh, if possible uh, to a different to different parts not the infected uh, with covid but a different part in the hospital that you can provide or uh, some in some hospitals they have uh, for example divided the cath lab to uh, to a covid for example um, uh, one one room for covid patients and the second for non covid or uh, different uh, hospital clues to COVID and non-COVID from the uh, from the triage, the ambulance triage. Uh, <clears throat> so if the if it's negative, uh, we proceed with the usual uh, and re-evaluation for fever or clinical sign of infection is is important always. Uh, patients with STEMI during COVID, uh, depend on the type of access to the care. Uh, self-presenting or STEMI network, so ambulance. If transport to the hospital with 24, uh, the cath labs, there is a cath lab service, uh, timely primary PCI is possible. Uh, if yes, so primary PCI, if no fibrinolysis, the same as with the patient uh, uh, presented into, into the uh, hospital hospitalized uh, a hospitalized patient or a self presenting patient uh, there's no change in this uh, in this uh, <clears throat> guidelines patients with uh, with non stemi uh, 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 categorized into four uh, four categories uh, low risk intermediate risk and high risk and we have very high risk patients. Uh, the <clears throat> uh, for very high risk patients, uh, we follow the STEMI pathway, so an immediate uh, invasive strategy for high risk patients uh, and intermediate uh, risk patients. We test for uh, <clears throat> for COVID of positive trans transfer to COVID nineteen equipped hospital or if there is a, any floor in the hospital that is equipped for uh, COVID-19 and capable of doing, uh, of taking care of non stemi patients, you should transfer a patient to uh, early invasive after test results, uh, target less than 24 hour, uh, or maybe non-invasive testing. Uh, <clears throat> for low risk patients, non-invasive testing uh, after the testing for COVID. Uh, <clears throat> management of a chronic coronary uh, syndrome during COVID-19, continuation of medication, the application of uh, telehealth uh, in the patient, uh, <clears throat> revascularization uh, must be postponed in low and uh, intermediate risk patients, postponing of none. Uh, postponing of non-invasive testing uh, patients should be considered during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. City and geography should be preferred to non-invasive functional testing during COVID-19. Uh, screening of COVID infection should be considered before cardiac surgery with nasal swab and CT scan. Revascularization of high risk uh, uh, chronic uh, uh, coronary uh, syndrome patients may be considered during pandemia, pandemic uh, COVID pandemia. Identification of COVID 19 free hospitals may be considered as a hope for uh, for car cardiac uh, surgery, invasive uh, management, uh, positive patient should be uh, deferred until uh, the patient has recovered whenever possible. Heart failure patients, for heart failure patients, acute heart failure may complicate the clinical course of, of COVID-19, particularly in severe cases. Uh, underlying mechanism of uh, acute heart failure may include the following acute myocardial injury due to ischemia, infarction, uh, inflammation, uh, such as in myocarditis and the ARDS, acute kidney injury, uh, stress-induced cardiomyopathy, tachyarrhythmia, and uh, acute uh, myocarditis with direct de de demonstration of COVID or inflammatory 
uh, infiltrates. Uh, the, car the myocardial necrosis is, is very rare. Uh, COVID-19 uh, pneumonia may lead to the worsening hemodynamic status due to the hypoxemia uh, and dehydration, hyperperfusion. Uh, uh, the level of uh, pro BNP uh, in heart failure, uh, it might also be increased in COVID patients. So uh, the, uh, the use of bedside uh, echo uh, should be considered in these patients, keeping in mind the prevention of contamination of personnel and equipment is very important. The treatment of acute heart failure in patients with uh, COVID infection should be equivalent to those without COVID-19. Uh, COVID the risk of COVID-19 may be higher in chronic heart failure patients due to the advanced age and the presence of several, several comorbidities. Uh, chronic heart failure patients with COVID significantly, significantly have higher uh, risk of adverse uh, outcome patients with chronic heart failure should uh, closely follow protective measure measurements. Uh, uh, ambulatory heart failure patients, they shouldn't visit the hospital. The uh, uh, guideline directed uh, medical therapy uh, should be continued in chronic heart failure patients, irrespective of COVID of COVID nineteen. Uh, telemedicine should be considered. Whenever possible. Hypertensive patients, self isolated hypertensive patients, and hospitalized hypertensive patients, and self uh, isolated continued treatment of antihypertension. No need to adjust medication or stop ACE inhibitors. Uh, there was a, an idea that the uh, the, uh, the usage of uh, ACE inhibitors and ARPs uh, during COVID. Uh, is not is not recommended. Uh, that uh, that was a theory because uh, uh, they thought uh, that uh, if you give the anti uh, if you give ACE inhibitors, you enhance the uh, production of more receptors, and as a consequence of this, uh, the uh, the more receptors, the more. Uh, the virus can replicate inside the cells and more attacking the cells and contribute to the uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the the higher adverse effect uh, to the patients and uh, uh, to the COVID worsening COVID state of the patients. Uh, in, in hospital patients, uh, and this hypertensive, there are there is a uh, or there is acute kidney injury. Continue treatment. No need for adjustment. Monitoring for uh, monitoring for the arrhythmia. Checking plasma potassium level because uh, hospitalized patients, uh, COVID patients, they usually have uh, hypokalemia. <clears throat> so antihypertensive treatment again. Uh, with an angiotensin uh, converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers, for example, valsartan or uh, captocryl, uh, there are no studies showing that there are blocking drugs, um, say even in Tristo, uh, increase the ACE uh, to a level in human tissues. Uh, therefore, the, the theory uh, of, of uh, not to use the AC inhibitor and RBS is there is no place uh, for such a for such thinking. <clears throat> arrhythmias, uh, for example, we have tachycardia, tachyarrhythmia, uh, target of, for potassium more than four point five milliequivalent and supplement with IV magnesium, correcting uh, hypoxia, acidosis. Other way, uh, any usage of the mechanical ventilation, for example, in patients in mechanical ventilation, uh, or adjusting by uh, giving fluid to the patients, increasing beep, increasing if I or to adjust the inotropic medication, decreasing the epinephrine, dopamine, or dopamine. If where there is acuity uh, interval more than four, for uh, 460 
Melissa can consider stopping all QT prolonging medications. And this point is very important in COVID patients because those patients, they are taking medications that prolonged, prolonged the QT interval, uh, such as uh, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, and also azithromycin, which is an anti Biotics and anti-inflammatory. Consider transthoracic, uh, thoracic cardiography, if hemodynamic instability or therapeutic uh, consequences. Uh, if you knew LV dysfunction, consider myocardial in injury and escalate of uh, escalation of uh, immunosuppression, immunosuppressive uh, suppressive, uh, therapy. Uh, rule out myocardial ischemia in a therapy refractory uh, VTAC and respiratory insufficiency, uh, <clears throat> I consider it more for the patients. So here, uh, this is about the uh, the the uh, QT prolongation of QT interval in COVID patients under anti antiviral therapy. Patients with known uh, congenital lung QT syndrome acquired lung QT syndrome, uh, use of or the use of uh, QT prolonged medication like in COVID, structural heart disease, bradycardia, if yes, uh, ECG or monitor strip with a uh, lead one or two. Uh, if there is a <clears throat> QT more than 500, then consult the cardiology, millisecond, consult the cardiology. Uh, if no, start the anti uh, viral treatment uh, for four hours. Do another ECG. If uh, increased to five, more than 500, 500 or more, or QT increased more than 25% of the initial uh, ECG done, uh, or ventricular ectopy, uh, if there is, consult the cardiology again, uh, or, or uh, if no, continue for therapy. Uh, <clears throat> So here, brief talk about the uh, vaccines. If, if you were asked uh, by patients that uh, that had uh, cardiovascular disease, um, uh, if I should have vaccination or not, vaccination are, are vaccines are very effective therapies to prevent uh, SARS uh, uh, severe severe COVID infection. It has been tested in large scale. Uh, randomized uh, trials. There are few, very few contraindications to vaccines, and cardiovascular is not uh, cardiovascular disease are not uh, contraindication. A time delay is needed uh, in patients uh, in in the patients that uh, that uh, had a recent COVID infection. Uh, the one that is high risk should be prioritized. <clears throat> Important point, uh, uh, equity. Uh, so the resource should be allocated uh, without discrimination between the uh, the, uh, the patients, uh, preserving as many life as possible, uh, and also protection of the professionals involved. Uh, those are very important points, and actually, Mainly the guidelines and uh, suggesting that avoiding doing certain uh, procedures or or certain uh, <clears throat> uh, or certain uh, interventions uh, just for the protection of uh, of uh, professionals because uh, COVID nineteen is highly contagious uh, contagious disease. Uh, those are my reference. Thank you very much for your for your attention. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Dr. Muslim, for the presentation. Is there any question from the audience? Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for your presentation. I have a question. You, you talked about the um, the shock and the heart failure and all of that, but uh, and thank you. But 
um, what about our population, like our cardiac surgery patients, uh, somebody, let's say, coming to your OPD, and uh, there's only coronary artery disease, no hypertension, no comorbidities, and the patient's for elective cabbage. And let's say the patient has history of COVID um, recently, but cleared uh, from the infection uh, control. Would that patient be treated differently? Would you expect the patient to have a different um, prognosis or a, like a different, is there anything that you will do differently for the patient? How does this change um, the way we, uh, we approach this patient? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I think this is a good question. Uh, I think I will do, for example, I will do for the patient CT, uh, just CT, just to uh, see how bad was COVID on the patient if there is fibrosis and how how will be the post-operative care of such patients. Also, I would see if he, he have taken his uh, vaccines before, I uh, will make sure that uh, uh, everything before going into this elective cabbage, that uh, his cardiac status, if there is no new echo, we will do echo. Of course, for every patient you are doing echo, but uh, the CT lung is, uh, I think, is vital on those patients. This is my. So usually we ask for a CT if the patient had a history of intubation and mechanical ventilation during his COVID infection. Otherwise, if he's having no history, so I don't believe CT will add anything. Okay, so based on your reading, was there like any article talking about a certain period of time that we need to wait before scheduling the patient for surgery? No, I haven't uh, read about such a like timing, proper timing of uh, after COVID infection. Should uh, the patient wait uh, for a certain time? No, I haven't read about such. I think till now there is no 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 such a guidelines or clear uh, input regarding a clear timeline for the surgery. So in case of elective, we usually ask for a vac uh, if the patient is vaccinated or not. If he's vaccinated recently, we, we would try to delay his surgery uh, for a, at least two to three weeks. Otherwise, I, I don't I don't think there's anything to be added in a COVID patient if they had a history of COVID. I'm asking this because I, I went through a paper recently and they were talking about um, those with recent COVID infection, if they go for cardiac surgery, if any, any cardiac surgery. Um, and they weren't like uh, talking about a certain uh, comorbidity or a certain like, um, uh, they weren't saying in, uh, they went for ICU admission because of COVID or anything, just history of COVID. Uh, they saw that the patient who had history of COVID, they had higher mortality and long hospital of stay, but they didn't really specify like what happened during the, the post-op. So uh, anyway, yeah, I, think I, I think I've heard such a paper, but they mentioned an intubated patient who had intubation and ventilation uh, and ventilated period, uh, in their COVID uh, fiction period. But otherwise, I, I don't think, uh, Madri, if anyone having any input or anything to be said, I can, uh, uh, up to my knowledge, if the patient has a history of uh, intubation and mechanical ventilation, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. I had a, uh, done a presentation uh, early on about COVID and cardiac surgery and had a follow-up also of, of that um, uh, about a year later. Um, and the instance of um, heart failure and myocardial infarction and um, ECMO use and the mortality rate associated with all that. The recommendation at that period, and I, I don't have a current uh, view at this time, but it's almost about a year ago, <clears throat> that um, if the patient have positive COVID, we would delay his surgery, elective surgery I'm talking about, delay his surgery for, uh, they prefer for three months, at least for six weeks. 
risk. So mm -hmm. that was the recommendation from groups. Again, it's all um, non, I shouldn't say, it's, it's non-randomized and non, it's just a perspective, not uh, actually it's just observation on their patients' uh, groups. If the patient comes in at the time of uh, uh, admission uh, with active COVID and being treated for that and, de and develop uh, myocardial uh, issues, the treatment then is conservative. Uh, again, I, I remind you, this was uh, about a year ago. Things may have changed since then. Conservative treatment, meaning that the patient will be treated as much as possible with medical treatment. And if he goes into florid heart failure, they will uh, um, treat the patient with ECMO. And uh, so the ECMO will be uh, both for the lungs as well as for the heart. <clears throat> Still with that, about uh, the mortality rate was about somewhere around uh, 50 to 60%. Um, so those are the, the, um, the recalls from that presentation. And um, I'm sure there's something else that uh, have came up uh, regarding this. Um, that's it, thank you. <clears throat> Shukran, Dr. Farid. Yeah. Dr. Farid. Aywa? Yeah, uh, I have a question regarding, I think we all have been through that era, the COVID era, and we ha we all had so many calls from the ICU re for an ECMO uh, insertion for patients. My question, uh, how many patients have you seen they made it after ECMO insertion? Um, again, our practice, I think, was similar to that, uh, what has been reported. At that time, we had about somewhere, I think, about 15 or 16 uh, patients uh, went through ECMOs. We actually, okay, <clears throat> our hospital have, um, at one time, it decided that the hospital will be um, a COVID-free area. So the uh, all COVID patients that were referred to us or developed within uh, the system were isolated in uh, the East Wing. And then later on, I think they moved. Uh, the, so if they needed OR, special OR was prepared for them in the ER. The kind of isolation of the uh, premises. Um, just like I said, the, the results at that time was 50 to 60% uh, mortality rate. We did have our uh, own share of mortality with similar numbers of uh, survival. Survival is somewhere around uh, 40%. So it, that was at the peak of things, the peak of uh, the, the epidemic. And uh, the, uh, the severity of the COVID was very obvious because of uh, the lack of vaccination at that time. Okay. There, is a website, there is a website that talks about ECMO in COVID. I have not visited that site uh, recently, but it showed uh, some patients have benefited and have survived. And it's if you are faced with those patients, um, uh, they according to, of course, the resources of your hospital, et cetera, um, and your expertise um, in treating ECMO patients, um, but uh, they are recommending strongly to give those patients that option. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Farid. Uh, thank you, Dr. Muslim, for the presentation, and thank you all for attending our weekly activity. Uh, so, see you next week, inshallah, and have a nice week.